Tonight, live from Virginia Beach, Virginia, podcasting all things musical from Southeast Virginia. Our sound, our songs, our artists, and our business. Welcome to SivaCast with host Tom Farley and Alton Riddick. Let's get talking. Ladies and gentlemen, this is another episode of SivaCast, episode six, another artist spotlight. But this time we have an extra special artist because all our artists are special. But this is an extra special artist for so many reasons. This is the Tom Farley, the man <laughs> behind Steve McCast that toils and makes sure y'all listen to the songs in Southeast Virginia from Southeast Virginia artist, the guy that puts up with me. So with no further ado, our artist spotlight, Mr. Tom Farley. How are you, sir? Doing good, man. Thanks for the kind introduction. I appreciate it. No problem, man. It's earned. Well, you know, it's always fun to do stuff with you. It basically, you know, it, it, this whole journey has been really cool. I'm just so glad we're together doing it. Yes, sir. It's been wonderful. Actually, I want to start out with an anecdote. Sure. I think this means a lot to me in the, for a lot of reasons. But the main reason is when you look up and you see a poster of a musician, you never think that you'll meet them. Then you meet them, and then you'll never think that you'll work with them for any reasons. For I mean, in my case, many reasons. And then life just has a way of doing things. Yeah, it does. And so when I was at Indian River Junior High, I walked into the office for some reason. I promise you I wasn't in trouble. But I walked in the office for some reason, <laughs> and I saw. Um, but there was a poster of Tom Farley. Well, at the time, it was Mr. Farley. It took me two years to call him Tom. But at the time, it was Mr. Farley. And it was Songsmith, which I didn't realize that was your first record until you told me. Absolutely. And I was like, whoa, that's like real. So we had like a rock star in our our school. And everybody referred to him as that. Even, Even now, you know, we've aged, obviously. And anytime I mention I'm working with you, anytime my wife mentions that I'm working with you, it's like, Mr. Farley, really? Yeah, you're that guy, bro. You're too kind, man. <laughs> no, that's real. I keep telling you that. I believe real. you. I believe you. But Okay, I'm just saying, even if I didn't like you, I'd have to give you proper <laughs> that. I don't like that guy, but he sure was famous. You know what I'm saying? So I just wanted to put that out there to let you know how much you mean to all of us in the area, how much you meant to all of us in school. You're a great teacher, but you're still a rock star to us. Thank you, man. I appreciate that so much. You know, Indian River community has a tremendous amount of great, uh, a well of great memories and uh, and faces to go along with it. So it's uh, it's important to know that you're respected in your community, no doubt about it. Well, let's get started, man. I mean, I'm going to be, and see, y'all have heard enough Artist Spotlight to know how it goes. It's usually just me giving you an intro and saying thank you, and I say nothing, but this time I'm going to be Tom. And Tom is going to be the artist. So when did you begin your journey as a musician, sir? As a songwriter or just playing? Well, uh, like most people, I started early uh, uh, as a teenager. I uh, I guess maybe mid-60s. I, I actually wanted to start playing an instrument. Drums was the first thing. Uh, I guess maybe around 65, I went out and mowed lawns and got me a really beautiful blue sparkle snare drum, which drove my parents up the wall. So so I got away from that, sold that, and then got into an electric guitar, which was a piece of crap because the strings were so far off my off the fretboard, it made my fingers bleed. Until then, I, I unloaded that and finally got um, got a, a classical guitar with nylon strings, which of course was you know uh, a real plus, you know, as far as you know making sure you get in and, and playing. Um, so I mean, you know, so it, it basically drifted into the guitar thing. Uh, got into high school. Uh, when I was in high school, I, I really didn't date all that much because I, you know, I was a pretty hefty guy and pretty hefty guys. don't they have friends, but they don't have girlfriends, if you know what I mean. True. So I, I sat around, I, I wrote a lot of poetry. I shared that poetry uh, with one of the girls. Her name was Kelly Young, who also played the acoustic guitar. And, and she basically showed me that, okay, you know, uh, she was doing the Joni Mitchell uh, kind of stuff, and I was starting to get into Dylan and, and Paul Simon. And, and so, you know, finger picking and easy strumming and stuff like that, writing you know, oversimplified songs and stuff. But, you know, that that was the foundation, you know, as far as the songwriting was concerned. 
uh, went away to college at Tech, and um, first two years there, hardly any music at all. And then uh, one of the best, probably the most, uh, you know, impacting moment uh, as far as music is concerned. I start, I lived with uh, my best friend Steve Gallagher, and Steve was you know always into recording. He was into uh, different instruments and stuff like that, and definitely into original material. He was also the first kid on his block to get a four-channel uh, sound-on-sound tech uh, recording deck while he was at college, and we put that thing to use, and we started experimenting, and it was just a revelation. So uh, as far as, you know, uh, the songwriting started uh, started to pick up, uh, you know, we started making songs and putting things together at, at an early stage, and um, even after I got out of college, I taught for a year, then I quit for uh, a little bit more than a year to pursue a career in music, um, which ended up being, <laughs> I was playing at the, uh, the the lounge at the Holiday Inn Midtown, uh, which was playing to an empty room every single night. Uh, I guess people understand what that's all about. But uh, two great things came out of that. Uh, first of all, my, uh, you know, honing a little bit of performance skills, but also that's where I met Tanya. Tanya was a day bartender. She came out to see me one evening uh, and we got hooked, hooked up the first night she took me home and we've been together ever since. So, um, so that was a, a, a monumental, you know, uh, thing as far as, uh, you know, the musical career is concerned. So it's always been there and it's been evolving ever since. I love you. Wow. So I'm glad that you quit teaching for the rest of us. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I, I did it because I really wanted to try music before I got locked into a paycheck. Yeah. And then when they, they actually called me back because this guy died at Indian River Junior High School and they right. needed a teacher quickly. So they hunted me down and uh, I just made, you know, the decision. There's no reason in the world why I can't have a musical career and a, a teaching career as well, because I love them both. So, you know, once you love something, the energy's there and, you know, you can make, uh, you can make uh, that work. Sure thing. Sure thing. Wow. What a story. Okay. So where do you find your inspiration for your songs? Um, personal experiences, mostly uh, relationships with people, places that we've been, uh, things of that nature. It's amazing. Uh, when the muse, you know, floats down and sits on your shoulder, you know, what things might come to you. Usually it comes to me in these waves, these spurts of, of creativity. Uh, I remember I sat down and in, in the course of an hour, I wrote uh, Professional Back Roads Man, Pimp Mobile, and Mangy Dog Blues. Boom. There they were. It's just and with very little modifications at all. It just came um, in early 2016 or it might have been 2015. Um, I really got into uh, uh, to writing about four or five songs came within the course of like two or three hours. And from that core of songs came the By the Fence and the Sun album. So, you know, it uh, uh, there's a lot of inspiration that comes, uh, you know, sometimes nature. Uh, wrote Leningrad and we went to Russia. There's all kinds of different things that can really promote uh, or trigger, uh, I guess you could say, a creative wave. So. Uh, I've been really, really fortunate. As a matter of fact, I, I get bombarded. Sometimes I, I really don't take the time to write down the ideas that have come to my head, and they get lost. And I'm sure a lot of songwriters, you know, can appreciate that. So, well, do you find? I mean, based on what you just said, do you find that you have moments or you know long stretches of you know desolation where there's nothing coming? You're just kind of like practicing or whatever, but you're not really being prolific at all. Well, prolific, yeah. That there, there are times when things subside, but um, I really believe that uh, I'm thinking all the time. Whether it's uh, you know 
working on things or, or just enjoying playing or whatever the case might be. And I really think that uh, there, there's, there comes a, a time when things really just kind of come to a head. For example, uh, I wrote a song called Better With Age, and that was dedicated to Bob Young, who was an incredible influence on my life. Uh, he was part of my men's group, uh, the founder of my men's group. And he passed away. And uh, his big thing, even on his license plate, was yin and yang. You know, the, the good, the bad, the plus, the minus, you know. Uh, and that song is about the good and bad parts of actually growing old, uh, which he taught me. Uh, and uh, I, that's a lesson that I learned. Uh, I'm just so happy that that song has gotten the, the reception that it has because he deserved it. He inspired it, and it came very quickly. It was like, boom, there it was. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, sometimes it's just a matter of sitting back and, and having the time to reflect, which, at, you know, being retired, I have that time. Right. So just reflecting on things allows me to, I guess you could say, just uh, uh, have the chance to really, you know, work out uh, the ideas and thoughts that I might have at any given time. Okay. Understood. Well, have you received support and encouragement from families and friends over the years? I mean, I know you have, so it's kind of, I know, but, you know, tell the people, you know, how much you've received or how much it really takes to really do this the right way. Well, I can tell you, um, this October, Tanya and I will have been married 44 years. Uh, and Tanya has been, without a doubt, uh, my greatest supporter, my greatest critic, and also, in, in a lot of ways, my greatest collaborator. Um, I, I, I turn to her. If, if something sucks, I, she'll be the first one to tell me, and you need to work on that. You need to do this. That sounds great. Whatever the case might be. Right. But also my parents. I mean, when I quit school, I mean, they helped pay for two years of my college. And when I quit, I was wondering exactly how they were going to take that, you know, because they were really supportive of my education. But the first night that I played that Holiday Inn gig, who was sitting in the front row of my parents? Uh, right. What That's incredible, right. you have no idea the feeling that that brings on. My friends have always been there for me. Uh, I have now a, a network of of incredible friends and uh, colleagues that uh, I record with. Uh, right now, there's about, I don't know, I guess close to 50 that I've already recorded with, uh, whether they be uh, engineers or certainly musicians, but also vocalists. Uh, and those people, uh, uh, we have a relationship that that goes beyond, I guess you could say, the norm, uh, simply because uh, they – they enjoy my original material. I love their interpretations that they that they bring to to their particular instrument on my original material. And I work hard when I engineer to to make sure that they sound good and that they're heard in my recordings. So, uh, and I think they appreciate that as well. So, yeah, uh, there's been support and encouragement and also collaboration over the years that has been just uh, a blessing beyond beyond words. Got it. Now. If you could imagine, I don't think that you could, or maybe it might be really difficult, but could you imagine and then tell the people what it would be like if you did not have this and you were really out there on your own? What do you think it would be like if that was your situation? It would be hard. Um, I know that uh, that in the early days when I just learned how to play, you're off, always on your own, it, not too much collaborating going on. Uh, but you know that would be very, very difficult to, to fly solo in every aspect of the game. Uh, the collaborations are, I've always been uh, into different collaborations. That's always been the juice. And uh, to, to do that, um, you know, with, to not have that is, uh, would be a, a real loss. Uh, but also, uh, it would be very, very difficult unless you could actually play all the instruments, do all the recording, all the rest of that kind of stuff. It would be very difficult to really uh, fully realize your passion and fully realize and create your sound if you had to do it fu fully on your own. Got it. Understood. Okay. Well, what made you decide to record your first album? I mean, where, where did that inspiration come from? Because you had done stuff before. So what made you decide to record your first record? Well, a, a good question. Uh, ever since college, uh, I've been doing home recording stuff with Steve Gallagher, who is my best friend. Mm -hmm. uh, we have experimented more than you could ever possibly imagine the last 40 years. There's, uh, you know, experiment with equipment, experiment with phrasings and experiment with microphones and, and, you know, a different, you know, reverbs. And I mean, it, it's almost endless. Uh, experiment, experimentation is very much a big part of what we did. But then I had the, the, the opportunity and the great honor, I feel, to play with the Herndon Edwards band. 
Uh, they asked me to come uh, up to Silver Springs and record with them. Me and Donnie Satterwhite joined the band up there. And I performed with them for about a year, year and a half after the album came out. And I actually saw, uh, you know, the response that, that people had. Uh, David uh, Edwards was really influential in getting the band Airplay. And once they had Airplay, uh, we went to, he would bring two or three boxes of, of albums to, to our gigs. And they would be gone, literally gone. I mean, 30, 40, 50 albums sold it at any given, you know, time uh, while we were out playing. Wow. And that really made a, a very, very strong uh, impact on me. Plus, looking over the shoulder at the en- engineer at uh, at the uh, uh, studio uh, when we were recording was a, was a real education. So I um, I decided to, to do our, our our the first album. I uh, pulled together a whole bunch of people that uh, um, that uh, that were very much a part of of my musical circle at the time. Uh, vocals were me and Tanya and Denny Smith, uh, who used to sing with Happy at, in Tech. We recorded Live Oak with Steve Peppis. Uh, and um, that was, a, that was a, a revelation in and of itself. We had great songs. You know, Mangy Dog Blues was there. Uh, Joe Daly Carroll was there. Norfolk Days, Pitmobile. All those songs were on that album. So it kind of they had great songs to play. So Live Oak was a great experience. But I also wanted to have the mixing experience. So... Um, uh, Steve and I hopped on a plane and went to Quadraphonic in Nashville to, to have the album mixed. Uh, Quadraphonic was where uh, Neil Young did Heart of Gold, where uh, Dan Fogelberg did his first two albums, uh, where uh, uh, Jimmy Buffett did Changes in Attitudes. That was the mentality that I wanted. So we went to Quadraphonic, paid a boatload of money to have them mix it, and then sent it over to Randy Kling and Jim Michaels, um, uh, no, no, not Jim Michaels, Jim Lloyd, uh, at Master Sound, uh, the best mastering place that there was at the time. Uh, the guy did mastering for almost everybody in the business. And uh, so we ended up with a great product. Uh, it was it was 1982. Uh, it was an album, you know, not even, you, and also we had it on cassette. But at the end of the day, um, the, the, the decision to make that, was was a big one. It was also a gigantic expense, which uh, basically we got backers, uh, four backers, um, Sharon Kelly, uh, Charlie Scott, Patton Bo Ludwig, who came out to my performances and believed in the songs. They put up the money. Uh, we did the album, uh, sold enough copies to actually pay, pay them back. And uh, it ended up being a great foundation for all the recordings that were going to come after that. That is an experience. A lot of people don't even have that experience. That is a lot. Well, I can tell you, uh, being in the same studio, using the same mics, uh, you know, doing a little last minute overdubs and stuff like that, looking over the engineer who mixed for us at Quadraphonic, his name was Willie Pavir, who was still teaching uh, engineering at a uh, college in North Carolina. That was, uh, you have no idea. I was a sponge. I mean, I watched every single move, listened to every single word that he had to say. Uh, picked up on a tremendous amount of engineering, you know, tricks and this, that, and the other, and and also the the the, I guess you could say the spirit of experimentation, the willingness to try something new uh, to get a new sound, and that was always a big deal. Wow, I hear you. It paid off. Yeah, it did. Well, do you believe you have developed a distinctive style over the years? So you think you developed something that when I hear your record, it's like ah, that's Tom. Do you think that you've gotten there? I do. I mean, it's a very simplistic kind of style, but um, going back to playing with Cam Head, uh, anybody who's had the joy of playing with Cam Head knows what high energy acoustics means. Uh, there's just a, a, a boundless energy. Uh, and I use that on my rhythm guitar because basically I am a rhythm guitarist and I love being a rhythm guitarist. It opens up me uh, the ability for me to play with a lot of great lead players. But the finger picking aspects also are very, very simple. They have a lot of traditional background to it, but also the little trills and stylings. Uh, there are little things that I do, which I enter into almost every single uh, finger picking thing that I do, uh, whether I'm doing solo or whether I do two finger picking parts that, that uh, you know, are blended together with each other. I, I go back and I listen to early recordings and I see that it's there. And it just was always there every single time. It was just, you know, the way that I play, but I really don't hear anybody else playing those little trills like I do. And a lot of the acoustic uh, up-tempo, up-tempo, excuse me, uh, rhythms, uh, those things I think are, are, are very much a, a sign of, of who I am and what kind of 
energy I like to bring to the acoustic music that I play. Okay. Well, going on the same path, who are your major influences with respect to playing, recording, and production? Well, I have to go start with rhythm guitar first for sure. Um, Richie Havens. Watching him uh, on the stage at Woodstock was a revelation. I mean, that man had energy. He had passion. He had everything that I wanted in terms of being a rhythm guitarist. And he was, I love his music. The other guy, a lot of people know, but they don't know him by his name. His name is Alan Davies. He was the rhythm player on a lot of uh, recordings that Cat Stevens did. And his rhythm guitar was excellent. I mean, he had really nice, subtle moves, and 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 I just really loved listening to this man play. So those two guys, without a doubt, for rhythm guitar were um, were a big, big influence on me. As far as finger picking, I look to uh, Paul Simon, uh, even though I never picked up his style. Uh, a couple of little things on the, on their earlier albums that I was able to play, <laughs> no way I could play like Paul Simon does now. Um, also, Bob Dylan, uh, a lot of the simple, uh, you know, folk p- finger picking that he did in his early albums were very much a, an influence on me. Um, recording wise, uh, I always like to aspire. You know, Paul Simon to me had some of the best production, uh, you know, I guess, I guess you could say uh, mantras. Uh, all of his albums have great production. John Lennon's last album uh, was was a stunning production. Um a lot of home studio experiences, uh, things that were just little aha moments with a certain, you know, key or a certain mic. Um, vocals uh, were always a big deal uh, when we were playing. I mean, you know, when it comes right down to it, uh, the vocal thing is is one thing that I think really sticks out. Uh, the harmonies and things like that that were actually um, uh, recorded on each one of the songs. Uh, Songsmith had me and Tanya and Denny Smith. And then, uh, you know, Calm Before the Storm had me and Tanya and Jerry. And basically, uh, when we were doing our acoustic act at Cimarron, was me and Tanya and Vernon Martin, who was an excellent musician and singer. So, so with every single time that we were together, it was a different harmony sound. You get three different voices, you're going to get a different sound. But I love that. I, I mean, th- it was great to be able to actually work with these people and find that blend that blend that came from performing first, but then eventually, you know, translated into the studio. How do you engineer that, that resonance and all the rest of those kinds of things? So that was a really big part of it. Um, so, I mean, you know, uh, but at the end of the day, um, it all goes back to Tanya. When you consider that singing with her for over 45 years, every single part of the three part harmonies that we made, two of them were Tanya and I. And on the last few albums, like uh, uh, especially by the Fence and the Sun, except for one song when David Edwards chipped in a uh, uh, third harmony on on uh, his song uh, "Say Goodbye to Me," all the vocals, all the harmonies, uh, uh, three part harmonies were done by Tanya and I, which I really loved. So I mean, you know, uh, there are nice engineering moments. Uh, love all my songs, but you know the the different musicians and the vocalists and the combinations that they had and their stylings brought some a new sound to every single project that I've done. And that to me is, that's the juice. I mean, who wants to sound the same every single album? So, I mean, and those people have made all the difference and I love them. I mean, you, you can listen to their performances and know how really good they are. And I was just blessed to have them along the way. Okay. Well, since you answered a lot of the next question, do you have as far Sorry. as it's all good, man? Because I was just letting you roll. It's all good. Do you have any favorite? Well, you already kind of sort of answered the favorite songs part, but do you have any favorite musical performances? Like when you were with Cam? Because I remember when I was a kid, you were with Cam. Like that was your guy. Oh yeah, love you know, playing with Cam. I, I watched the videos of us uh, and his performance uh, as a so as a lead guitar player or as a rhythm player it was stunning, um, and. Uh, but there is one, the High Energy Acoustics Band, without a doubt, in 2016. Uh, it was the last uh, live performance that I did. Uh, had eight people on stage. A lot of people don't understand. That group had never played before, ever, ever. We had a rehearsal five days before. Had two and a half hours to go over 18 songs, and then we were on stage. Those people, their performance that evening was inspiring. Uh, it was and the fact that I actually got the tracks to create a live album from that performance. Out of the 18 songs, we were only able to, uh, I was only able to actually glean nine. 
but they are nine pieces of gold. That band, without a doubt, had a synergy and a connection and a fun that uh, was instantaneous. They had never played before on stage live for anybody, and they only played that one time. You listen to that album, and that performance was, without a doubt, the single most, I guess you could say, well, I can't say enjoyable because I enjoy performing all the years I performed. But that one was was really uh, an amazing uh, collaboration with the musicians who were there. So, yeah, High Energy Acoustic. That's the reason why the album is called First Take, because it was the only time those songs were ever played. And considering that they were my original song, except for a couple of, of covers, they loved playing to it. And you could tell, I mean, it just translated into uh, just a wonderful, wonderful uh, playing or performing experience. The crowd loved it. And the, the album definitely shows uh, the, the quality of the, of the, uh, uh, the players on that evening. Wow. Would you say that as a whole, that experience was like the culmination of everything in your life? Your well, to a certain extent, well, I can tell you one thing. It spoiled the hell out of me. <laughs> There's no way. I mean, you know, I, I hired uh, Richard Spano, who not only set up the PA, uh, but also played bass for us and recorded the, uh, you know, digitally recorded the tracks so I could engin- engineer them into an album later on. Um, but the thing is, is that... Um, that to be able to actually get those that quality of musicianship, 300 years worth of, of studio and stage experience were on that stage that night, over 300 years. So uh, at, at the end of the day, those people came together. Uh, just there, there's, you know, there's so many things that could go wrong, but they came there to do one thing and one thing only, and that was to serve the song. And they did so with just incredible uh, artistry and and talent and performance. So. Yeah, I mean that there that's hard to beat. It really is. And anybody out there who has played with people, uh, to have that kind of result, uh, simply because these people, you know, did what they what they did best and did it in the moment, uh, and also the fact that they did it to my original material, uh, a really blessed moment. There's no doubt about it. It was a stunner. Okay. Well, seeing that that was your last, you know, live performance. How important are public performances to your musical life now? Well, they're they're always performance is always important, but uh, you know, to me, it's not a necessity. Uh, first of all, I have, there are time issues. I have medical issues, uh, uh, logistics with collaborators. I mean, everybody who I love to play with is working a day job, and now with the virus and stuff like that, I've really put an eighty six on any studio sessions and stuff like that. I still play my instruments every single day. Uh, <clears throat> I like the idea of keeping up my chops and also. It's therapy. I mean, you know, the joy of playing. Uh, I also, you know, uh, have this thing sitting in with the band where I play, you know, my instruments along with you know, some of my favorite recordings. Uh, I don't copy the recordings. I just sit in with them. And it, it's fun. Uh, it, it's a way of me uh, to, to actually stay engaged uh, with the performance aspect, but also uh, just to have fun with my instruments. So I know that how important performance is to a lot of folks, but to me at this particular stage of my life, um, if I get asked to do a concert, fine, but I want it to exactly the way it was with the high energy acoustics band. I want to be surround myself with the finest possible people in Southeast Virginia. And I want to walk on stage. I want to haul in the equipment. I don't want to do any of that. I want to make sure that, that we're prepared but I also want to have the fun of, of knowing that we can actually get up there and actually produce that kind of product. Well, being that your, your live performances, you know, have declined, you're not nearly as prolific on that end. Tell us about the business of music that you're so into. Well, thanks to you, my brother. Uh, we have got Siva sound up and running. Um, 
We, you know, as well as I do, we've worked really hard on on developing loop collections. We have loop collections for me and and uh, Greg Weichel and Bernie Lee and Barry Shoemate. Uh, getting into music licensing. We have uh, several of the artists in, in Southeast Virginia that I'm brokering uh, their music uh, for them to try and get them some money uh, as far as uh, uh, synchronization rights and stuff. Um, hooked up with all the PROs and the agencies I need to be. And of course, you know, Radio Siva. Uh, Radio Siva has been a, 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 a completely new avenue, but it also allows me to not only sh- to share the air with who I believe to be uh, the best artists in the country. I mean, you know, and they, they're great songwriters. They have great uh, production skills and great performances. Uh, people just need to wake up and understand that this is where it's happening. Um, my next move is into internet radio. Uh, I'm going to get Steve Peppers to help me with that. And basically, um, uh, that will be the last frontier, so to speak, because all the other things are in place. So, uh, and hopefully maybe get some music licensing stuff. It'd be nice to sell a song to a movie and sit back and, you know, live off the royalties of that for a while. So, uh, but there, there's always business going on and the business of music is something that, uh, uh, people in the area, uh, hope that they'll, you know, listen to our podcast and pick up a little bit on that, but it's, it's a very, very broad and expansive uh, area to get into. Okay. Well, to take it home, how can all the Steve Cast listeners find out more about you? I know, the calendar of events thing is like done for everybody for now, but other than those things, you know, how can we get to know you? How can we hear your music? How can we get, you know, how can we get a taste of Tom Farley? Well, if you go on Google and type in Tom Farley music, that opens up an explosion of of different links and stuff like that. Uh, You can go to Farley music services. You can go to Siva sound. Uh, You can certainly listen on radio Siva or go to the Siva sound website. There's a a whole section there uh, of pages uh, for radio Siva. Um, you can get touch on Facebook. We have, uh, have my own music page on Facebook, but also we have, uh, uh, Siva sound and we also have radio Siva and the fans of radio Siva. Um, uh, you can go to those pages and, and get in touch with me anytime. Uh, looking forward to, you know, to sharing, uh, more videos and stuff like that. Right now we have over 100 videos on my YouTube channel. As a matter of fact, the free me, which is our, uh, rock anthem against addiction, that particular one just uh, topped fifteen thousand views, and the amazing thing about that is, it's not a, you know, it's not millions. But that song has never been performed live, and yet the people really, really enjoy it. So at the end of the day, you know, there's all kinds of avenues where you can find me and listen to the music. Uh, The videos are are actually really pretty uh, excellent. So um, give them a shot. And I think that you'll you'll be surprised at that, at what you'll find when you go there. Well, sir, this has been a treat for me. This has been a wonderful. Yeah, me too, man. Uh, I appreciate everything about you, especially as I've gotten to know you personally, I've always known you as a teacher, but to know you as a man, as a musician, all those things has been nothing but a joy. I think we can all say that to know you. So again, thank you as from a personal standpoint, thank you as an artist and thank you as a partner. Well, thank you, buddy. I can, I can tell you from my heart that uh, the intersection of in life uh, where we actually came together was a great moment in my life and uh, it will continue to be so, man. And I look forward to good things for us down the road. I appreciate that, and I certainly concur. Well, thank you, buddy. Uh, just uh, uh, have yourself a great day and give Lauren a hug, and uh, I'll see you on the next SivaCast, bud. All right. That was it, ladies and gentlemen. Another SivaCast uh, artist spotlight, Tom Farley. I appreciate your listening. Y'all be kind for free. See ya. Check out Radio Siva by going to the Siva Sound homepage and clicking Radio Siva 
or to live365.com and search Radio SIVA. If you have any questions, comments, or topic ideas for SivaCast or for Tom and Alton, go to SivaSound.com and click on the contact tab.